a topic that I have a canned lecture on. I found out today that I had to do this talk, so hopefully we all can glean some important information from this large topic. So treating prox proximal humerus fractures is a spectrum of challenges dealing with the a varus fracture, two-part cervical neck with calcar uh, comminution, dealing with the three to four-part valgus impacted fracture with pseudo subluxation versus the fracture dislocation in the young patient with high energy injuries. This lecture is going to talk more about surgical indications and surgical treatment as opposed to non-surgical, but I will touch on non-surgical treatment uh, as you know, a majority of what we do in, in treating patients with proximal humerus fractures. So the epidemiology of proximal humerus fractures, the majority of patients are older. It is a bimodal patient population. Older patients, female, osteopenic, low energy, fall, low energy injury, low energy fall versus the younger patient, motor vehicle accident, high energy fall from a standing, from a, from a, from a height causing more significant comminution and displacement and more need for surgical intervention. Once again, it's a two to one male to female ratio. It is considered a uh, fragility fracture and is 4% of all fractures in adults. And 85% of these patients can be treated non-surgically with good results. So everyone knows the near classification. However, recently there's been some, some, uh, uh, controversies in regards to does the near classification, is it valid, do all fractures fall within the near classification, and should we use it as something to determine when we should do surgery, and that remains to be seen. But all residents know about the near classification. So we'll go on the greater tuberosity fractures. So those that require surgical intervention and isolated greater tuberosity fractures are the ones that have superior and posterior displacement, which can cause cuff dysfunction and subacromial impingement. Uh, greater tuberosity fractures in isolation are also associated with rotator cuff tears and rotator cuff dysfunction. And the traditional criteria that Near uh, described was displacement greater than one centimeter. However, there have been much literature out there in younger, more athletic patients that even up to three millimeters of displacement may be an indication for cuff repair and or, rot and, and or greater tuberosity fixation. So what is the treatment, uh, the surgical treatment for greater tuberosity fractures? Uh, there are two workhorse uh, type techniques, a deltoid split, which we do for standard open rotator cuff repair, or a delta, delta pectoral approach for some of the larger fragments that may require uh, plating techniques. Suture fixation augmented with a plate uh, frequently prevents further displacement, uh, allows for better fixation, suture anchors into the head to allow for cuff repair as a backup or check rein to a greater tuberosity displacement has greatly aided us in fixing tuberosities. And plating techniques may be needed for common fragments or larger fragments involving the tuberosity. With the advent of the arthroscope and some of the newer implants we have used for rotator cuff repair, there have been some uh, recent uh, studies of doing arthroscopic internal fixation or arthroscopic in assisted internal fixation either with hardware or suture techniques such as transosseous equivalent techniques which have uh, made it much more uh, easy to treat some of these uh, smallerly reduced tuberosity fractures in younger patients and also addressing any intraarticular pathology that may be there also. So tuberosity RF technique, a lot of the younger residents now probably have never seen an open cuff repair, but there is a deltoid split. You find your lateral border of the acromion, you identify your axillary nerve, you make sure you're less than five centimeters from the split to prevent axillary nerve injury. You identify your fracture, you place multiple sutures through the groove and through the bone and also through the tendon itself and do a rotator interval closure, which allows you for good fixation of a tuberosity fracture. Then we go into two-part fractures of the surgical neck, the ones that are more amenable to internal fixation and the ones that are comminuted, which prevent a stable reduction. They usually require fixation. Uh, and medial comminution, which, which allows for calcar insufficiency, varus malalignment, which is not tolerated properly, and tuberosity uh, prominence, which allows for subacromal impingement. Those are the patients that will require surgical intervention in the two-part surgical neck fracture. So here's another patient, as you see here, this is a two-part surgical neck fracture. Uh, on the axillary, it doesn't look so bad, but if you look here, you see some calcar comminution. You see the sagittal, the axillary alignment's fairly good, but on the AP, you have varus tipping, calcar comminution. This is not amenable to closed techniques unless they're much older and infirm.
Three-part fractures, the issues with treating three-part fractures that are displaced are malrotation of the head on the shaft and also malrotation of the tuberosities causing for cuff dysfunction and poor rotation and function to the shoulder. You have to maintain your head height relationship to prevent subacromial impingement and also to allow for cuff function properly. And varus is not tolerated as well as valgus is tolerated. So if you have someone who's in varus, that's someone you may want to consider more aggressive surgical treatment as opposed to those patients that are in valgus. The classic four-part fracture, who do we fix? Do we fix those that are young? They have a higher rate of uh, AVN. They're also associated with fracture dislocations. The younger patient with the blasted proximal humerus with an articular segment or a head split uh, fragment may require arthroplasty. And in the elderly patient with the four-part fracture or the four-part fracture dislocation due to the poor blood supply and poor bone may be required for reverse shoulder arthroplasty. This lecture will also talk more about internal fixation techniques when we briefly talk about arthroplasty later on in the lecture. So the valgus impaction fracture, that does not uh, fall into the near classification. It was identified uh, by the Germans uh, as a fracture that falls outside of the guidelines and is a different type of animal as a true four-part fracture. Why is that? The medial hinge is usually intact, meaning the blood supply to the proximal humerus is usually intact. If you see here, the head is sitting up to the ceiling, which will make you think that the, this is a four-part fracture, but the medial hinge is intact. Here's our lesser tuberosity, so the head sits low, the tuberosities stay in place, and you can see uh, abnormality with the tuberosities to the head. But when the hinge is intact, the blood supply is intact, so your risk of AVN is lower. And there are special considerations for treatment. If you can get it to it within 10 days, percutaneous techniques can be utilized. If not, open techniques with bone grafting are a very uh, a good technique for treating this type of fracture. The varus fracture is the one you have to be wary of. They typically have calcar comminution. The deforming forces uh, of the cuff and the pec allow for continued instability, and these can be fixed with a locking plate very well. Pinning is not a good option due to the stresses across the proximal humerus, which will cause for additional failure, and AVN is still an issue with these types of fractures, despite you thinking that the blood supply is still intact. So standard imaging for a shoulder, the near trauma series, AP in the plane of the scapula, a, a, a scapular wire or a lateral in the scapular plane, and an axillary, sometimes a trauma axillary or a velpo axillary, which we're always fighting the ER and the uh, radiology techs for. We also need to use CT. I think CT and 3D reconstructions have really revolutionized what we can do in treating proximal humerus fractures. It can help us identify head splits. It can help us identify glenoid injuries and also uh, tuberosity displacement and additional fracture patterns. Uh, CT is a great help. I use it in a majority of my fractures that may need surgical intervention, and 3D reconstructions have been a great benefit in surgical planning. It can help you determine surgical versus non-surgical treatment, and also can determine the type of surgical treatment that you use after re uh, reviewing your CT scan. So predicting humeral head ischemia is extremely important. Ralph Hurdle and JSCS in 2004 gave us three criteria that can give us up to 97% predictability of AVM. If the length of your medial calcar segment is less than eight millimeters, if you have loss of the uh, medial hinge showing instability of the proximal humerus fracture, and if you have an anatomic neck fracture, if all of these three are shown to be on your uh, fracture patterns, then your risk of AVN is 97%, and it may guide you into treatment for these patients. So I, I put this slide in because no one ever thinks about nerve injury in patients. When testing the policeman's patch, it's very difficult to truly assess if there's an axillary nerve injury. And there was a study done published in 2001 in JSCS that showed they took on all comers, non-displaced and displaced proximal humerus fractures, and they found that 67% of patients with proximal humerus fractures had a subclinical nerve injury identified on EMG, and 82% of displaced fractures had a uh, nerve injury on EMG, and 60% in uh, non-displaced fractures had a nerve injury on EMG. And why is that important? Because patients that have nerve injuries may take longer to recover and sometimes up to two to three months longer to recover. So when you have a patient with a non-displaced proximal humerus fracture, and they're just not getting their range of motion back, or they're struggling with getting their function back, and maybe because they have a subclinical nerve injury, and time is of the essence, be patient with these patients, don't jump to something else that may not improve their function. It's also good to know that nerve injuries can occur, and you may not see them on your physical examination. So the surgical indications and options for treating proximal humerus fractures are displaced fractures. Now remember, most proximal 
proximal humerus fractures don't have a problem healing. It's about their anatomy is distorted and it can affect their function postoperatively. The options are ROF, RIF with pinning, locked plating, arthroplasty options such as hemi or reverse, or rotting techniques. The Europeans have been very uh, instrumental in, in devising more rods. I'm not a rod person, but the rod is out there. So percutaneous pinning, who are the patients that you can fix uh, these fractures with? The indications are select two and four parts. Truly the two-part cervical neck fracture in the young patient with good bone or a four-part valgus impacted fracture that you get within four days or within 10 days are the ones that you want to consider for percutaneous pinning. You want to avoid varus fractures because the forces are too great. You want to have reasonable bone. You don't want to use them in the osteopenic patient. And you want to use it in the appropriate patient that can follow post-op guidelines. So here's a four-part valgus impacted fracture. How do we know that? Head sitting up to the ceiling, lesser tuberosity here, greater tuberosity uh, there. Tuberosities are prominent. Here we are under fluoro, using, uh, working through our fracture planes and percutaneous techniques to get uh, reduction techniques using tamps. We can use pins along the calcar to stabilize the fracture and various pins and screws to stabilize our final construct. The issues with uh, percutaneous pinning is it can have loss of fixation, patient compliance isn't the greatest, and especially if you use it in poor bone. So perk pinning is a viable option in certain fracture patterns, two-part surgical neck and good bone, uh, or a four-part valgus impacted fractures that you get acutely. You can get AVN in these patients up to three years post-op. So what are the other surgical options? This is a great technique devised by Dr. John Fenlon, who was one of our uh, founding fathers of shoulder surgery, especially here in Philadelphia. The parachute technique, we use it in selected two-part fractures of the surgical neck in the elderly that do not have a significant amount of comminution. It's a valgus impaction osteotomy where you jam the shaft up into the head in valgus. He used Dacron tape. I used number five ethabond with shaft fixation. And these patients have tended to heal very well. There's no implant uh, uh, complications, and there's no hardware complications. So if they were to fail this, there's no pins or screws floating around in the shoulder or articular abnormality that could cause even further damage to the patient's shoulder. So plate fixation of proximal humerus fractures, do they always work? So the historical plating was either blade plating techniques or some of these clover plates or T-plates. We found that they weren't strong enough to, to take care of the fractures. AVN rates were high and non-union rates were high. So locking plate fixation came out in the late 90s and early 2000s when I was a resident. Initially, the Philos plate uh, in Europe they basically were lock screws into the head that acted as small little blade plates. You could strip the tissue less. You had a contoured plate to the proximal humerus. You had multiple sites of fixation, which gave us a, a better way to treat the, the stresses across the shoulder. However, you still need an appropriate reduction. So uh, I tell people that this is the Indian, not the arrow, that makes this fracture work. Uh, the implant does not fix the fracture. The surgeon fixed the fracture. Uh, Jack Nicholas can go out and play any golf course with persimmon woods and shoot par. And any schlep that can go out there with a $2,000 bag of golf clubs can shoot 50 over par because he stinks. So it's important for you to do the surgery properly, technically, and then your, your instrumentation in your plates only augment your abilities as a surgeon. So you have to reduce these fractures. So current indications for locking plate fixation, displace two, three, and four part fractures, varus fractures, valgus impacted fractures that are too late for pinning, historically based upon the literature, 10 days, osteoporotic fractures, comminuted fractures, and failed non-op treatment. So beware of the varus fracture. There is calcar comminution and deforming forces which make it non-able uh, to be treated with pins or, or with uh, conservative treatment. They have a high rate of varus collapse and screw cutout, so these require locking plate techniques. So which plate do you use? Arthrex plate, Smith and Nephew plate, Synthes plate, whatever plate you want to use, Raman plate, it's whatever you can do as far as to fix the fracture properly to follow anatomic guidelines, the plate can just augment your repair. I set these up in beach chair. I typically use a deltopectoral approach, however, some traumatologists have been using the lateral deltoid split approach. Uh, I, uh, technically, that's something that's beyond my, uh, my abilities. Uh, you need to have this equipment here, K-wires, sutures, fluoroscopy, bone graft, lamina spreaders, and always have an arthroplasty and select fractures as a backup. So once you open up the fracture, the key is to get oriented. You use the coracoid as your lighthouse. You find your pec insertion in your biceps. 
You run up the rotator interval and identify your, frat, your tuberosities. Uh, and you also want to palpate the axillary nerve. So by opening the rotator interval, you can see where your head sits. You can identify what's your lesser and your greater tuberosity. You can then tenedes your biceps if necessary. I then put rotator cuff sutures. I put sutures in postro superiorly in the cuff, superiorly in the cuff, and anteriorly in the cuff. That aids in reduction, aids in bringing down your tuberosities, aids in strength of the construct in repairing your tuberosities also, and later aids in fixing it to the plate. Uh, fluoroscopy is critical. I bring it over the ipsilateral aspect of the shoulder. Some have brought it over the far side of the shoulder. It's good to get pre-surgical fluoroscopy shots to know that you're in good position. Uh, you work within your fracture planes. Here I am working through my fracture planes, bumping up the humeral head so we get a good tuberosity to the head distance. Then we can bone graft that area. Uh, in order to maintain reduction, that's the hardest thing. This is an orthogonal fracture, so it looks good in AP. However, when you put it into an axillary, the fracture may, may shift off. So I use cuff sutures. I use bone graft to augment my biologic fixation, but it also acts as a substrate to help me with my reduction. I use preliminary K-wire fixations, and I use the plate with indirect techniques. Later on, I'll talk about some techniques that I've been using which aid me in my reduction of these fractures. You need to restore your relationships, so anatomic is best. You are fixing these to restore the anatomy, not just to do an open reduction internal fixation. Don't do an OIF. You have to correct your inclination, get them out of varus. You have to restore your version to prevent rotational abnormality. You have to restore your head to tuberosity distance to prevent cuff dysfunction and subacromial impingement. And if there's comminution, reconstitute your calcar and use an implant that's strong enough to offset the, the forces. So, Locking screws in the head, you have to have in good bone, make sure you tap, tap, tap to feel good bone. You want to use a long enough screw to capture purchase, but you don't want to use someone that's too long and cause intraarticular penetrance. You can do about 45 to 50 millimeters on most screws, and you want to take off about four millimeters of the screw from the K wire that you use to the head. Your kickstand screws are crucial. You need one or two along the calcar to prevent calcar failure, and you also want to use an implant that's long enough to offset your calcar instability. Your screw placement, they should be splayed into the head so you have good, so you have good purchase kind of like in the hip. You want to make sure they're splayed into the head and neck to offset rotation. And you want to make sure you don't penetrate the joint. The postero superior screw is the one that typically is uh, penetrance. You want to keep those a little bit shorter. You want to check your fluoro and extreme rotation. If you've opened up the interval, you can stick your finger in the interval and try and feel for screws. You can rotate the shoulder and check for crepitance. And once again, Take about four millimeters off of your K-wire measurement to prevent settling of the fracture, late uh, uh, intraarticular penetrance, and also posterosuperior uh, uh, penetrance. So the critical step is your tuberosities. Keep it out of varus. I typically put sutures through the plate, and your final suture construct is sutures through the cuff, sutures through the plate, which allow for soft tissue repair, cuff repair, and bony repair. So case example here is someone with an articular fracture. We've reduced the uh, neck shaft angle. We reduced the tuberosity. We placed bone graft. We have good calcar screws and good splay of our screws, giving us a good, strong construct. So once again, here's another fracture, indirect reduction techniques. Bone graft, we used our plate to reduce our fracture. We have screws that are long enough, reconstituting our calcar. So post-op protocol is sling for six weeks. I start range of motion at around 10 to 14 days. Passive range of motion, re-x-ray every two weeks to prevent displacement. At six weeks, active range of motion, strengthening at three months, and I tell all my patients it takes one year to gain their maximum function. There are numerous studies that have shown good results with locking plate uh, techniques. However, complications can occur, and they are numerous. Osteopenia, lack of reduction, settling, intraarticular penetrance, AVN, glenoid injury, DJD, tuberosity escape, and it can occur secondary to the fracture due to the bone and due to the Indian. So uh, Crappinger and injury in 2011 gave us some predictive uh, values with locking plate fixation, and he found that patient age, bone mineral density, and medial calcar reduction and varus displacement or persistent varus increase your risk of failure of internal fixation. So surgical techniques are based on age, bone stock and activity. If you're plating the patients, make sure you 
need to elevate your angle to restore the neck shaft angle. Bone graft these from a biologic substrate reason and also to assist you in your reduction. You need to reconstruct your tuberosities. I use multiple sutures in the cuff, in the shaft, in connection to the fixation device. Bone graft substitutes are extremely important. Bone peg devices in certain circumstances. Trauma docs love using IM uh, grafts, but sometimes these can cause further difficulty with late uh, reconstruction with arthroplasty. And make sure you don't use too stiff of a construct. Don't put locking screws all the way through. You will make your construct too stiff and increase your risk of failure. So here's a patient who's 52, three-week-old, four-part proximal humerus fracture with, with uh, extension into the shaft and a large calcar fragment. Here I am working. Here's her head. Here's her tuberosities. Techniques uh, elevating the head. Bone graft was placed. I then reduced my calcar and my shaft with a screw. Head to tuberosity distance and the arch is preserved. Then I slapped the plate on long enough construct to stabilize the fracture. So with locking plates, these are still difficult to treat. Not all fractures need a plate. There's a high rate of complication, especially in the elderly osteopenic patient. So my evolution in some of these patients is to be doing an orthogonal plating technique. We'll actually reduce them in the front with an anterior plate, which prevents further rotation, augments my stability of the fracture, and then be able to put a plate on laterally and make a very difficult fracture into an easier fracture to fix. I can also use a less of a construct laterally to avoid violating the deltoid with some of these fractures because it can be difficult. So in conclusions, locking plates have allowed for evolution of treatment. We can use less arthroplasty. Reduction is still critical. You have to respect the deforming forces and don't perform an oif. So when do we do hemi for fracture? For me, I usually use it in a very limited focus, a younger patient with a, a four-part fracture or a head split. And with hemis, it's all or nothing. If they heal their tuberosities, they do great. If not, they have no pain but no function. So what do I do? I'm very conservative with proximal humerus fractures. The pendulum for me has swung more towards conservative, uh, especially in the elderly patient. I it, reconstruct as many as I can, meaning I fix as many as I can. I stick with my surgical techniques based upon anatomy and avoiding deforming forces. I use reverse for select elderly patients with four-part fractures or instability. And I use slow post-op rehab to ensure healing. So in summary, it's a large learning curve. I learn every single case. Fluoro is the key. Plain x-rays tell most of the story. Restore your re relationships, counsel your patients, and operate on the right patient. Thank you.